So what have we been doing? Well, on doctor's orders, I'm taking it easy on my eye and we're just chilling out here in Lake Worth, Florida with a, a few hundred of our closest friends. It's pretty pleasant here, except for all the boat wakes. Today, Q&A. You ready for coffee talk Q and A with Theo Kelly? I got all dressed up for you guys. And uh, I did too. <laughs> yes, you did. You got on a new shirt. I put on a shirt. Well, that was for you. I smelled kind of oh, bad. Oh, thank you. It's okay with everybody if I wear my sunglasses with this. It's so much easier. I guess the doctor said you should, right? Yeah, that's right. So how is your eye? That's one of the questions. Is it's it, better. It's better. Or was it? Are you glad we came up? Was it worth it? Come back. Well, I would much rather be in the Bahamas, but. Part of what may cause central serous retinopathy may be stress. And I will tell you that having the spot in my eye caused stress, which was maybe perpetuating it. So at least knowing what it is, I think it's a little bit better. So every morning I wake up and the spot is a little bit less. So And you, you're doing a great job working out, doing meditation, and also he's added something else to his de-stress routine. What's that? He's <laughs> watching a lot of like funny videos yeah on YouTube now that we have all the data <laughs> right I I just hear him over there cracking up <laughs> I like to watch cats eating pizza <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna do rapid fire coffee Q&A with the O'Kellys highly caffeinated Holly is curious about the weather apps that we use we use predict wind exclusively for our offshore work that is tied directly into our Iridium Go. We can also download it over the cell phone. Um, when we're in port, um, I am using Windy, like a lot of folks, and I am looking at uh, the NCEP models. I've got a list that I'll provide in the um, show notes here for this. That's a good idea. Are you seeing or hearing of good deals in the used market, and how do you think that this will play out over the next six to 12 months? No. We're not hearing of any good deals. In fact, uh, a couple of our consulting clients have made offers on boats and they've been very strong offers. My prediction, if we just summarize quickly, would be we will see softening in the used boat market, but it's gonna be at the very high end and at the low end. If you're looking for a boat in the 200 to maybe $500,000 range, maybe a little bit of softening, but not much. It's going to be the cheaper boats and the more expensive boats where you're going to get the bigger breaks. And I would say just anecdotally, we're hearing so much more excitement from people like, let's do it now. Let's do it faster than we planned. Let's let's get out yes. now. Life is short and we want some freedom. Yeah, we're hearing that a lot. And we are feeling like this is a good place to be for this pandemic. We have a little space around us and yeah, it feels safer. It does. Somebody asked whether or not we're going to have any plans to head south. And the answer is no, because everything's closed. But the second it opens up <laughs> right. and the hurricanes are gone, we'll be heading south. Basically, all the Caribbean islands have closed up and announced that at least for the rest of this season and through the hurricane season, they're closed. A couple places you can go as a U.S. citizen, you can go to the Virgin Islands, but then you're stuck there. Uh, you can go down to Panama. They want a 14-day quarantine, and then you can go through, if you bring your own line handlers, but then where do you go? Everything's yeah. closed on the other side. So we're gonna go where the wind blows, as they say, and we're gonna head up through at least the mid-Atlantic and maybe the Northeast. We're gonna explore some new ground because we've never been to the Chesapeake and that's not too far away. We hear that it's really, really fun sailing and there's lots of places to explore. So yeah, when we get a weather window, we're gonna head on up. And so many viewers have been saying they're up there and they're excited for us to come up. So we'll that's, see ya. we love that. Okay, Sarah's got some great questions. Would you buy from the moorings again? Don't spit your coffee. 
<laughs> we have hesitated making a video about buying from the Moorings. It was horrible. It and, was horrendous. And we've heard from so many other people, what, five other people that have had the same experience. Yeah. It, the problem is basically this. Moorings is a big company. They have this weird, loose association with the Leopard brokerage out of Fort Lauderdale. And what you get are brokers who don't know anything about the boats that they are representing. And the details, which are very important to you as a buyer, like engine time and condition and that sort of thing, they may just be pulling these out of a file, and this could be very, very dated material. That was one problem. Another problem was just dealing with the hassle of getting it surveyed and negotiating with the moorings. Um, but I would buy through, buy from the moorings again using a buyer's broker, but I would never do it myself. They were just too difficult to deal with. We will say that we have know some people who bought through Belize moorings and had an excellent experience. Yes, yes. Uh, some of these boats, these charter boats, are really, really beat up and others are in much better condition. And what we have been told and uh, have heard from these buyers is that the boats from Belize are in much better condition. They, they may fetch a higher price for that, but... Mm. They don't let the charter guests dock them, and they don't let them outside of the reef. So they're just not getting used as much, which is nice. For everything that I said negative about buying from the moorings, I have to add that it is probably the best way to get value in a boat. So you can get more for your money buying from a charter operator but you need to go in eyes wide yes. open. So the answer probably is yes, we would do it again, but because of what experience we've gained. And I think it's unconscionable that these people, these brokers in Florida can claim that they don't know about the condition of the boat. In yeah. this day and age with technology and the brokers on site in these locations, there's no reason why we can't have updated photographs and information yeah, before you book flights. It's really a dishonest business pra uh, practice. It would be one thing if it had just happened to us, but we have heard from so many yeah. buyers who have gone down to the islands to buy a boat. They show up to look at the boat and they're like, this isn't the boat in the photographs. Yeah. What the heck is this? It happens over and over again. Especially after the hurricanes and we even heard from somebody who went down to survey a boat that they get down there and they learn that the boat had been dismasted. And do you want to know what the broker told them? The moorings broker in Fort Lauderdale? Oh, that happens to all boats. All boats get dismasted. Can you imagine that? So that's crazy. Okay, moving on. Um, are you still in love with the Leopard 46? Yes, and more so every day. Um, the more we see other designs, the more we realize that the compromises that were made in this boat are really perfect for us. She is really a, a, a fantastic sailing boat, fast but not too fast, stable but not too heavy, um, comfortable, lots of space, well thought out. Good looking. Good looking. Yeah, yeah good so. size. Yeah. No, I would buy a Leopard 46 again. Yeah. Patrick, thank you. He says that we do a nice job staying fit on board. <laughs> okay. Soft focus. Do lenses. we have any recommendations for regular cardiovascular exercise while on a catamaran? Well, you do yoga. Yeah, and you we both try to do some bands. You've been real consistent lately with doing his squats and lunges and push-ups and body weight exercises are pretty easy to do on a boat balance exercises, of course. And then we don't have TRX bands, but we have made our own, I guess. Uh, some bands out of some webbing and some handles. That's about all you need. Other than that, when we're in nice water, we're swimming all the time and paddle boarding, and it's not that hard to stay fit. I ran to the store yesterday. And it's because so, it's a yeah. rough neighborhood. <laughs> so you didn't have to stay in the dinghy for very long. It's a rough anchorage. Yeah, anchorage, yeah. I was Dock. tied to a rusting concrete Thing. Dangerous. <laughs> the adventure. So are we running the water maker or are we going to the dock to fill up? Yes, we are running the water maker, but sparingly. 
We filled up offshore and made a bunch of water and we've slowly been using it uh, over the last week since we've been at West Palm. We have been back flushing the membrane every uh, three or four days. In fact, we should do it today. And that keeps the water that's in the system from getting weird and putrid. Uh, but we will be slowly using that water up and we'll need to head back offshore. We try to stay off of the municipal water systems if we can. It depends on where you're at. Some water's better than others, but water sitting in these lines and in these plastic tanks, if there's anything in it, anything biological, it gets gross in a hurry. So better to just use the water maker water, which is sterile. Okay, Ray has a question, several questions about tips on dealing with boatyards and services while on the hard. This one could be a video in and of itself. This could be a series of videos. I would say get a referral before you enter a boat yard. We don't use that lightly. I mean, get a referral from somebody you know. Who was just there Who, because management changes too. Ownership changes. Uh, I'm going to say some of this tongue in cheek with a little bit of harsh reality in it. Each boat yard, they're making a lot more money on one particular part of the business and it depends on the boat yard. Some boat yards say, sure, you can do all of your own work. You don't even have to use our contractors, but you've got to buy your materials here. Oh, and by the way, they're a little more expensive than you're going to find elsewhere. Other boat yards will say, hey, you can come up on the hard. We're not even going to charge you lay days. Those are the days just sitting on the hard. We're not even going to charge you, but you've got to use our contractors. You've got to use our labor. Yeah, like you can't do any work on your boat, which seems ridiculous totally ridiculous so you really need to research what their rules are the best boat yards are the ones that give you the most freedom and flexibility the other tip we would say is to micromanage the heck out of it and take notes along the way of how long they're working on your boat exactly what materials you used on which day because when it comes time to launch there could be uh, some extra things you didn't know about. There are almost always extra things that you didn't know about that they decided that they're going to charge for. This last haul out at Cracker Boy Riviera Beach is literally the first time I've ever gone in to pay my bill and not had to haggle with them over things that showed up that I hadn't asked for or materials that I knew hadn't been used. It's a really common practice to overcharge for the very small things, like charging you $8 for a mask. You know they paid $1.54. Uh, charging you a lot for tape and brushes. So check your Facebook, ask around friends of friends, just get a referral. Absolutely. There are great yards out there, and I was really happy that we ended up with Cracker Boy Revere. I'm Beach. too. We love Cracker Boy. Okay, have you ever sailed through the Panama Canal? Nope. In fact, you can't sail through the Panama Canal, by the way. <laughs> oh, it's a trick question. It is. <laughs> no, you have to motor through and even then you're more or less being pulled along by line handlers. So you float through the Panama Canal and we haven't even done that. So Austin asked that question. Thank you, Austin. He also wanted to know if we could sail to any country, which would it be? This is really hard. I got a lot of places I want to go. South Pacific, French Polynesia, and the Tuamoto Islands. Those are my tops. You? Uh, I would say Tonga and New Zealand. Tonga is pretty awesome. Oh, I've been Tonga. there. New Zealand has been a lifelong goal. I really hope this thing opens up because we were on our way there and I yeah. still want to go back. And I also want to cruise around in a little, you know, bus on New Zealand. Roger wants to know how do mooring balls work? He understands how we connect to them, but who owns them? Do you pay? Do they show up in charts? How do you know if you have a big boat that you're not too big for the ball? That's a great question. All really good questions. You first? Charts will show mooring fields, generally. And it just depends on the mooring and the municipality on how much they cost and how big of a boat. And generally, it's about 20 to $30. And usually the mooring balls will even say, this is for a boat 40 feet or above. Overall, moorings are a great idea. You can put more boats into a smaller space than you would otherwise if everybody was anchored. But <laughs> there are big problems with moorings that aren't maintained. We personally know a couple of boats where the mooring snapped 
and they ended up on the reef or aground with damage to their boat. So if you take a mooring, you really wanna dive that mooring to make sure all the gear is good. We personally would much rather anchor, but in some spots you just can't. Lowell asks, Nick, you mentioned that you composed the music for the channel. What is your musical background? Did you play in a grunge band? <laughs> Do you play any instrument other than a laptop? Can you imagine if I had long hair and a goatee and flannel? In his dreams, he does play in a band. Uh, it's weird, yeah. I have this recurring dream. I took piano lessons and piano lessons as a kid not particularly talented at all, but I, I hear compositions in my head almost all the time. And I use two tools to produce the music that you hear on in the beginning of these, of these shows. I use Apple Logic, which is a DAW, it's a digital audio workspace, I think is what it's called. And then I use what's called a linstrument, a linstrument that is kind of a cross between a guitar fretboard and a piano setup. Um, so you can do all sorts of cool pitch bends and tremolo and that sort of thing. You can put a lot of personality and character behind these electronic instruments, but I really enjoy it and and I love making music. You're good at it. It's Getting a lot better of fun. and better each time. Yeah. Like everything, cool. practice makes perfect. It does. Alan says, after a lifetime as a sailor, when I retire next year, I'm considering a power cat for some cruising in the Northeast and the exploring the Caribbean. Any thoughts on power cats and generally any things to think about? I really like the smaller power cats. Those 37, 38 footers. It's like everything you need for a couple. They're fast, but they're not too big. They're maneuverable. Stable. And you just turn a key and you, go, you just go. The bigger ones, and one of our coaching clients uh, is is interested in buying one of these larger 40 foot, 44 foot plus boats. The engines get really big in a hurry. We're talking 250 horsepower each side. It's a lot of gas, a lot of fuel to move those things around. I always say get the smallest boat you possibly can <laughs> and i really like those pdqs whatever they are 35 37. so you're always joking that eventually we'll all end up in a power boat it all it i don't happens. think it's a joke i think you're serious i love them <laughs> i for now i really love harnessing the wind and going long distances it's magic for me every time we raise those sails but i can for sure imagine a day where i don't want to wait for the wind i just want to get there and Go up the ICW, Go, up do the, the Great Loop. Absolutely. Yeah, a lot of good things about a power cap. And maybe by that time, we're talking about electric motors and not using so much diesel, and that'll be the win for everybody. Holly just recently bought a Leopard 45 and has taken delivery this winter. Cool, Congrats. congratulations. Any insights on what you can do to make her more comfy for cruising? We got a lot of ideas. I think obviously all the soft touches, adding color, textures with rugs and pillows and bedding obviously make it more comfy. I don't think that framed pictures have much of a place on a boat, but matte, matte mount, is that what yeah, it's called? we have a few of those. Cardboard mount photos, family stuff, just stuck up to the walls with adhesive, really adds to the warmth and comfort and the personality of the boat. I have uh, one thing that I can suggest that will make a world of difference on your feet, and that is Sea Deck or something like Sea Deck. That's the stick down foam rubber pads that we've got in the cockpit. I'm not actually the biggest fan of the company. I don't think that this stuff wears very well. After three or four seasons, some of the stuff needs to be replaced, and for the cost, I think it should last longer. But. The comfort is amazing. It is, it's kind of a difference. It's kind of like a rug almost. And like it's, a yoga mat. It's very soft on the feet and just feels really, really good. That's good for comfort. Also, if you can get uh, your helm position mostly enclosed, not just from the water and spray, but from the sun. Yeah. Stay out of the sun, you'll be a lot more comfortable. Good ones. Mike asks, have you ever participated in an ARC race or similar rally, and do you intend to? We are kind of lone wolves. Not to say that we wouldn't ever participate in an ARC or a Baja ha ha type of rally. But for the most part, we like to be on our own schedule, picking our own weather windows. Um, so don't rule it out. 
but probably not our thing. That being said, I think there is tremendous, tremendous value in going along with a group if this is your first time out. Can you imagine how much better off we would have been if when we left San Diego oh 18 years ago, we would have been with a big group? Yeah. We would not have run into the storm. No. We would have had so much more camaraderie and it would have been great. Yeah. But at this point, mostly we, we move by ourselves. Yeah. All right, so I hope that was helpful. We love your questions. Keep them coming. Fantastic to have the interaction with you. And if you've got other specific questions, just hit us up on our private Facebook group or in the comments section, of course. Um, we answer things as quickly as we possibly can. we got some travel ahead for us, so if it looks like it's a few days, that's because we're out and about and not connected. And if you haven't subscribed, go ahead and hit the subscribe button if you want to hear more from us. And if you, <laughs> and, and, and if you want to listen to us uh, for an even longer stretch, uh, you can go to Stitcher or iTunes and go to Under the Sheets with the O'Kellys. It's our podcast that is even more, I guess, behind the scenes, a little yeah. bit more about our life and lifestyle, and we enjoy doing that too. A big, big, super huge thank you to our patrons. Thank you so much. We really appreciate the financial support from folks who've logged on to patreon.com, but also gone to our website, saleclarity.com, and there is a tip jar there. If you'd rather go through PayPal, we appreciate that as well. It we really is lifting us up and motivating us to keep going and feeling like we can do this longer than we had anticipated. So We want to keep this party going. <laughs> We want to see you guys out here, so hurry up, get out here. Hope everybody's doing okay, and uh, we'll see you next time. All right, thanks. Bye.